welcome to Materialism Micro. In these episodes, we spend about 15 minutes going over an interesting material science concept. This episode, I interviewed Dr. Stephen Nailway here at the University of Utah. He does a lot of research in bio-inspired materials. I thought it was a fascinating interview, and I hope you'll enjoy it too. You may have noticed that we didn't put out a mainline episode this month as well. Unfortunately, due to technical issues, scheduling errors, and then a hurricane that left some of us without power for about four days, we were just unable to get it done. So rest assured, we're going to return to our normal schedule um, come next month. So look forward to that. And we have some great episodes on the horizon. So we're going to jump to the interview now, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm now joined by Dr. Stephen Nailway from the Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of Utah. Steve, how's it going? Not too bad. How about yourself? Uh, I mean, we just got hit with a hurricane, and... Uh, Life's been crazy since then, but I'm glad that we've been able to do this interview. Your research is quite fascinating. Uh, would you like to give sort of an introduction and discuss your background and how you got here? Yeah, sure. So um, I actually originally grew up in Oregon. So I traded the forest fires over there right now for the hurricane force winds that we have here. Um, but uh, yeah, I grew up in Oregon um, and I actually did my undergrad in mechanical engineering and then did my graduate degrees in a different field in material science. Um, and so, yeah, I, I had the opportunity to go down to the University of California, San Diego, which is where I did my PhD, um, and start working on bio-inspired materials. That was actually the first time I ever heard about it, um, is when I started doing my PhD. Um, and uh, after I finished that up, I actually came straight here to Utah. Um, and I'd never been to Utah before, but I enjoy it quite a bit. And uh, yeah, it's kind of how I got started in the field, um, and I've been doing it ever since. So break it down. What is a bio-inspired material? I think that's kind of a buzzword that's thrown around a lot, but what is the best sort of definition of it? It definitely is a buzzword that gets thrown around a lot. And I, and I know that because I go to a lot of conferences and there are people doing like drastically different things that have nothing to do with what I do. Uh, but in general, I mean, it's, it's the concept of trying to learn something important from nature and then apply it to some kind of new material. The way that I tend to do it um, has a lot to do with the structures that we find in nature. Some people actually try to like perfectly mimic natural structures. Usually that's kind of called biomimicry where they're actually trying to like make brand new skin, for example, it's exactly the same as human skin. It's just made in a lab. Um, or if you've seen these experiments, people try to like 3D print uh, uh, liver cells into a functioning liver or a functioning heart. A lot of people do that. But, but bio-inspired really has a little bit more to do with the idea that there are some really interesting concepts, structures that we find in nature. And can we take that information and build new things out of it? Not necessarily try to just copy perfectly the way a seashell uh, is made, but like, can we make a, a you know, ceramic seashell, a new a seashell using engineered materials and kind of get some sort of similar uh, mechanical benefit out of it. So that's really how I kind of define bio-inspired. And what is it about natural structures and uh, material properties that is so interesting? Why are we trying to, to mimic them and learn from them? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, the real reason why is because uh, there's obviously really complicated problems that we have to solve as engineers and material scientists, and it can be really hard to come up with solutions. And as it turns out, nature through evolution, through millions of years, has great answers to a lot of these questions. Nature is really limited in what it can provide. It only has, you know, this very limited set of pretty weak constituents in terms of stuff like collagen and calcium carbonate and hydroxyapatite, really not a whole lot of stuff it can work with. It doesn't have diamond and steel and stuff to work with. Um, but what it can do is provide incredible properties. And the way it does that is through really intricate structuring. The thing that nature can do that we can't do very easily is this really intricate bottom-up fabrication of materials um, that allows it to create these really complex structures that have properties that way outperform what you would expect based off of like a simple mixture of, of, uh, of constituents. Um, and so that's really where this kind of all starts from, is, that is can we copy those structures? Can we copy the fabrication techniques potentially of, of these materials and get similar kinds of mechanical advantages or structural advantages in general, property advantages in general? Yeah, I'm always fascinated when I think about different components of the body and how we're only made of four or fives. Oh, well, I'm not really sure, but only a few elements themselves. And look how complex of an organism can be made from that. Um, it, it is a source of inspiration and really shows us that we have a lot to learn still about what we can make uh, with all the elements that we have at our disposal. Absolutely, um, yeah. And so it seems like we have a, quite a vast array of possibilities. How do we classify or organize these bio-inspired materials? Well, there's a lot of people who try and do this. Um, I have a system that I came up with back during my PhD where we tried to figure out 
kind of what were the most common structural design elements based off of the mechanical advantages that they provide, right? So like if things want to try to be impact resistant, for example, they might provide a certain specific kind of design. In that case, we thought it was this helical design of uh, fibers that are aligned in sort of a helix pattern uh, as they grow through the material. Or if they want to be really strong in tension, they have these highly aligned fibers, this fibrous structure, similar to what you see in like a rope. Um, but I, you know, there's a lot of different people who try to classify it. Um, for what it's worth, I always think it's very valuable to do that because at the end of the day, I mean, it's hard to study every single organism on the planet and we really don't need to study every single organism on the planet. Uh, really what we need to try to understand is where are the common themes that could really help us try to solve some of the engineering problems that we face. Um, and so certainly like that's what I've tried to do in my research is try to identify those common structures. Gotcha. And so you found that those classifications have helped be sort of form a foundation that's help with further research, or is it just helpful to classify future findings? Well, I mean, I think both. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. like to believe both. Um, obviously, once you publish a scientific paper, it goes out into the out into the void and you hope it did something. Um, mm -hmm. You never really know. Uh, but yeah, no, I, th I think both. I mean, it's certainly the way that we conduct research in my lab is, is to try to mimic those similar structures. Like, for example, these helical structures I was talking about. We have uh, techniques in my lab where we can try to create that in different kinds of materials, porous ceramics, hydrogels, that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's really our goal, right, is we know these helical structures provide impact resistance. If we create a similar helical structure in a porous ceramic for like a bone material, can we get a similar kind of increase in impact resistance? Um, to which the answer is sort of, uh, for the most part with our research, but uh, we're working on it. We're trying to make sure we can get that kind of impact resistance. Yeah, what are some of the struggles that you go with trying to mimic nature? Is there something that nature is really good at that we haven't quite figured out how to replicate? Well, like I said before, the bottom up fabrication is something mm -hmm. that can do that's incredibly complex, right? I mean, if you think about like, that's the thing that nature has that we don't have is the ability to, to uh, fabricate these things from the bottom up. And, and for, for what it's worth, what I mean by that is the fact that unlike a lot of our fabrication techniques where we take some larger chunk of material and try and cut it down into a structure, nature obviously works from the lower scales, smaller pieces, puts them together. And in fact, I mean, it works from like the lowest scale. It can act, actually assemble individual atoms. Um, and there certainly are, you know, techniques that can do that on a small scale. AFMs can isolate individual atoms and move them around nowadays. But obviously nature does that not on a small scale. It's not trying to just put like five atoms together. It does that with however many quadrillion of atoms are in our body. I don't know how many it is, but it, it does all that, right? It's able to do that. And that's something we can't quite do. Um, so, I mean, certainly we do the best we can. We use techniques like 3D printing and uh, self-assembly techniques. And some people even are using, uh, you know, molecular assembly and stuff, which is a very cool field of research. Um, but it's something we haven't quite perfected yet, right? So we really do the best we can to try to mimic these structures um, in our new engineered materials to provide uh, uh, some kind of advantage. And again, try to just solve engineering problems that we face. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Uh, and it, it definitely keeps you going trying to go further. Uh, has there been a lot of attempts to adapt our sort of uh, top-down approaches? Um, have those been successful? Are there any successful case studies of this? Well, there certainly are. I mean, a lot of people do this. Um, obviously, I mean, it's a very wide field, so a lot of people are working on this, and a lot of people do use top-down techniques. I mean, a lot of people like to think of 3D printing as a, as a bottom-up technique, and it's certainly closer to a bottom-up technique, but in reality, it's kind of more of a top-down technique. It's still mm -hmm. using these larger chunks. It's just that the you know, the discretized amount of ink that comes out of the printer is kind of your structure. And then we're trying to build it into something more complex. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people do do these kinds of things. A lot of people have, have found techniques. Um, you know, a lot of stuff we work on right now and a lot of other people work on is trying to use energized fields to control these things because that allows okay. us kind of more depth of control, things like energy waves, like uh, uh, electromagnetic waves or uh, ultrasound waves, that kind of stuff. Um, where we can actually kind of control things on a more finite scale, if you will, than like a 3D printer. Um, and so we do do a lot of research in that. A lot of people do live research in that. So there's definitely been some, some good success stories. Um, but, uh, but certainly we're just, we're not quite at the same level as nature as it turns out. Right. Can you give some examples of those successful case studies, either from your own research or from stuff in the field? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we, we've been doing a lot of work, uh, like I said, on, on like ultrasound waves. We work with ultrasound waves to try to control things. Um, so as it okay. turns out with ultrasound waves, um, if you run an ultra, ultrasound wave through a, a liquid medium, it will create this pressure wave, right? This kind of wave of pressure through the material where there's sort of high peaks of high pressure and low peaks of low pressure. And as it turns out, if you have little particles in there, those particles are gonna to wanna to get pushed away from the high peak down into the low peak. 
right? And as a result, you can create these actually quite intricate patterns of particles um, because they'll all just want to assemble into these low pressure wave regions. And so we've been doing this with, with some porous materials that we're making uh, to create ring structures like you see in trees, um, you know, to get, create extra strength. Okay. Um, and also like layered structures, things where we have like hot layers of high density material and low density material, uh, which can allow us to have more uh, fracture resistance, for example. Um, so we definitely work on, on those kinds of things. That's great. Yeah, I remember when I first started, uh, the example that I always saw, and I think this is more on the biomimicry side, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of bullet trains will take um, inspiration from the shape of uh, various animal, various uh, birds, beaks yeah. and such, in order to become more yeah, aerodynamic. Um, I've also seen a lot of things with, um, you know, using gradients of materials, right? Because I know there's, I think it's lobsters or crabs or something, in their claws, they tend to have a gradient effect of changing composition. Uh, yeah. And I know a number of, there have been some implementations of this, a similar approach to designing materials to try to take advantage of uh, different properties at different locations. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I, crabs are an interesting one. I actually had a, a friend um, when I was doing my PhD. Uh, if you haven't, if you've never been there, so so UC San Diego is is right next to the ocean, but it's kind of over a hill. Mm -hmm. But the oceanography department is right on the beach, and so I had a friend who worked on crabs, and I always wanted to go visit because then I actually went to the beach. It's actually really nice. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, but crabs are really interesting because they, their their shell is made of chitin and not a whole lot else right and it's kind of hard to actually have a defensive structure when you only have one material to work with and so they do have this really impressive gradient in properties that they go throughout their shell um to in order to give them some defensive protection because really they don't have a whole lot else to defend themselves against anything um as much as we always like to believe that they have their claws out there like grabbing stuff it's pretty hard to actually like fight off a fish with just these car you know they have to have some defense right right um, but there's a lot of examples like, I mean, one of the one of the most famous examples people work on uh, is a seashell, seashells, and specifically the, the mother of pearl uh, inside, or nakers, it's called inside of seashells, which is 95 or 99%, depending on the species, uh, calcium carbonate, which is exactly the same material as blackboard chalk or tums, you know, it's basically that, which if you ever had a piece of blackboard chalk in your hand, it just breaks in half really easily. Mm -hmm. But seashells are really, really tough. And the way it does that is by structuring this stuff at this really, really small scale into essentially what you would think of as like a brick and mortar kind of structure, like a brick wall. Um, and as a result, it's really tough because if any crack grows through it, it doesn't actually go through the bricks, it goes around the bricks and it has to go through this really, really long, tortuous path. Um, mm -hmm. So as a result, it's really strong. It's a really strong material despite the fact that it's made of this really, really weak constituent. Um, and that's a really common one people like to work with. There's many examples, but it's just one example that people really like to work with. Mm -hmm. And do you find that you often have to incorporate um, multidisciplinary approaches in your work? Do you collaborate with people outside of your field often? I absolutely do, yeah. I mean, uh, material science, I kind of, I mean, if you think about it from the base, material science in general is, is incredibly multidisciplinary. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually, if you look around the country, I mean, uh, University of Utah is an, uh, an example where we do have an undergrad program, but a lot of schools don't actually have an undergrad material science program because it's kind of like this nexus of a lot of different fields, right? A lot of right. people from chemistry come into material science, engineering, physics, you know, biology, everything kind of come together in material science. Um, and specifically, what I do a lot is that uh, I found that when you're working on these projects, when you want to try and study something in nature, the easiest way to do it is just find someone who actually studies nature. Because uh, a lot of times these people, if you think about biologists, zoologists, uh, uh, herbologists, um, they, they know all this really interesting stuff about, you know, some specific plant species. They know what it's able to, I don't know, launch spines out of itself in self-defense, right? Mm -hmm. And they've always known this, but it's not their job to study why or how, I should say, right? They want to study how, you know, this thing evolved or, you know, uh, where its place is in, in the food chain, for example, but they don't actually want to study the physics of it, of how this happened. And so if you just go talk to these people, they usually can list off like four or five things that are really interesting to look at. Um, and so that's usually how I do this, right? When I was doing my PhD, I did it with the people with the oceanography department. Now I'm working with um, some people at Redview Gardens and also uh, some people up at the Natural History Museum that work on fungi. Um, and uh, that's basically what you do. You just go talk to them. They know all this stuff about the fact like there's a fungi that can explode up through concrete. Um, the guy oh, knows, wow. knows about, right? And so it sounds really interesting, right? So like, why don't we study this? You know, it's not his job to study it, but it could be our job to study it. So, so usually that's how you do it, right? You kind of just build this team of people who know different aspects of it and try to bring your expertise into the, into the situation. Great. And how often do you reach out to people in other fields? All the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I do it all the time. Um, 
hopefully my students eventually start doing it on their own. But uh, for the most part, I got to do it myself. <laughs> so, but no, I, I mean, we do, we do it all the time. I, and I mean, I would even say beyond that, you know, a big part of material science and, and, and building and studying materials is having to do a really wide array of, you know, testing techniques and, and fabrication techniques. And it's too much for one person to do in their own lab, right? I mean, maybe if you had millions and millions of dollars to buy equipment, you could do it all yourself. And I think maybe there was a time back in, I don't know, what, the 70s or something where you could do that, you pull that off. But that's just not the way research works anymore. There's no reason to have all this equipment in your lab. So you end up working with people. I mean, I work with people in the metallurgical department, material science, chemistry, biology, mm -hmm. just to use the different techniques that they have, right? So everyone can bring something to the team and then we can do something interesting with the results. Do you think that the necessity of having different um, disciplines and perspectives involved sometimes slows down the research process um, because you have to reach out to so many different people and involve them? I mean, it can, you know, mm -hmm. it certainly can. I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile. I, I yeah. always think uh, collaborating more is, is more, more worthwhile than collaborating less. I mean, obviously, then uh, you get to the, the real meat of doing research, which is a lot of interpersonal interactions and, and making sure everyone's getting along and stuff, right? Which always seems surprising, right? You go get a PhD and at the end of the day, it's really about, you know, trying to get people to work together. Um, right. But I mean, that's just part of the game, right? I mean, that's part of the job and it's a fun part of the job, right? Because the truth is none of us know everything, right? We all know something pretty well, but none of us know everything. And so being able to get together with a group of people and, and kind of learn from their experience can be really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. So where do you envision the field going in the future? What are some of the challenges that still need to be tackled and where are people within this field focusing their research on right now? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's, there's kind of two areas of growth in the field right now, I would say. One is just the fact that, you know, there are a lot of interesting organisms out there we still haven't studied, mm -hmm. right? And that's, a, I think that's a very valuable area of expertise, right? If people are studying stuff like, you know, crabs and seashells and stuff. They've been studying that for quite some time now, but there's always these different organisms out there that are really interesting to look at that we don't even know about yet, right? That people are studying. Um, and admittedly, when I go to a conference, that's the part I'm most interested in is who, who's actually working on some like new organism out there, has some new interesting uh, research. The last conference I was at, somebody was working on these cacti that are like a highly porous structure, but they live out in the Arizona desert where it gets super windy. And so they have to like be able to, you know, hold together. And so they have this weird structure so they can like twist in the wind. Like that, like I think that stuff's really fun. I think that's really cool. Um, that's one area. The second area is, like I said before, there is this massive challenge um, in terms of understanding and mimicking the, the way that nature actually does fabricate things, right? And it's really two parts, right? One is that when you want to look at a natural structure and you want to understand how it self-assembles at this really tiny scale, that's a very tough problem, right? Because, you know, AFMs happen in a vacuum, right? TEM happens, you have to take this thin slice of a material and put it into, you know, completely sterile conditions. That's mm -hmm. not going to work. You can't take like a seashell that's alive and put it in the TEM. It's now dead, right? There's no, there's no way, <laughs> there's no way to stick it in there and understand what happened, right? right? Um, and so that's a real challenge, right? How do we actually, you know, look at how these things are being formed, you know, from an actual like in vivo, you know, perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then just trying to mimic that, right? I mean, just having the techniques available to actually do this is something, not something we really have been able to figure out yet um, as a scientific community. So I think there's definitely a lot of room to continue to grow in this area. Right, and do you have any resources, books, uh, other podcasts, or maybe some videos for people who are interested in this field? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting field because like you said, it's a, it's a big buzzword. I actually don't know if I have any like really great answers for you in terms of that. Um, mm -hmm. My former advisor wrote a book on it um, and it's a pretty good resource in terms of like, uh, you know, kind of a, a more general area uh, to look at. But um, admittedly, I don't actually have a great answer for that for what it's worth. So um, okay. what was that yeah. book called? Uh, what is it called? It's like bio-inspired, biomimetic and, and uh, Biomaterials, I think is what it's mm -hmm. called, um, that my advisor wrote, um, which actually is a pretty, pretty good resource on it. Um, I actually also offer a class on it um, every other year uh, that we kind of focus on different, different things um, here at the university. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, there's, there, there are other resources out there. Some people do, you know, people are writing books about it and, and uh, um, obviously like doing with blogs and stuff, um, but I'm just actually not super familiar with it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, thank you so much for being willing to come and share your knowledge on the podcast. I think it's really great that there are still sources of inspiration that are all around us um, that are continuing to challenge us and provide us with paths forward and new and interesting ideas for materials. Um, any, any final remarks? Uh, no, everyone should get out there and study nature. We need more cool answers from nature. So if you know of some really cool uh, behavior, really cool material in nature, you should you should try to figure out why it does that. That's the whole point of this, the whole nexus of this research. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Yep, no problem.